Lord, we just thank you for tonight. We just uh, ask that you, again, just honor us with your presence. Come down and, Lord, have your way. Just teach us by your spirit. Prepare us to receive what you have for us. Encourage our hearts. Heal us. Um, cause us to look beyond now to see in eternity so that we can make the right decisions, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity to gather together without fear of persecution. Mm -hmm. And, Lord, we just ask that you just honor us with your presence. And may we honor by glorifying you. And we just say this in your name. Amen. We're going to look at Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you, your light in the Lord, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is on, in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. As we look at this, uh, we talked about before, Ephesians is a popular book, as you know, because... Uh, it emphasizes to many the inheritance. How glorious, people, such prospects for saints when it comes to our inheritance. But my question is, does that popularity still exist after chapter 5? Is it as popular, as unique, as important after chapter 5? You see, the first three chapters speak of what our inheritance looks like and the great work to bring it about according to the great mysteries of heaven. But now we're getting in, uh, chapter 4 is about uh, the responsibility, actually about putting on that new life, putting on the old life. It brings the contrast of the new and the old together. But now in chapter 5, we are being told how it's supposed to look and conduct itself. Now, we like to stay in the first three chapters, maybe chapter one especially, but how many of us come to chapter five and really look at what it means to be children in the light? Because if you're children in the light, that means you're walking in the light of who Christ is. You're walking in the light of his life. You're walking in the light of his promises of heaven and so forth. Now, we want to hear about all the blessings, but guess what? We don't like to hear about the responsibilities. We just don't. Uh, we want to walk the streets of gold. How many times? Oh, we're looking forward to the streets of gold. But my question is, why won't we walk out the blessed life here on earth? We have a blessed life here on earth to walk out, and yet we're so excited about the streets of gold. I like that story when uh, some guy came up to St. Peter and he had something in his pocket, and he says, what's in your pocket? To this guy, he says, gold. He says, you mean pavement? Remember, you walk on the streets of gold. It's pavement. And so here we have this reality we so get caught up with the idea of what's going to be like up there for us but how many of us are really walking out this life that we have in Christ the blessed life in us how much of how many of us are walking it out in this world right now we're supposed to be how many of us are doing that that's the question we are uh, we want the best most of us We'll say that, but my question is, why do we refuse to choose the excellent? Because that's what we do. We want the best, but we want the best of the world and not what's excellent as far as Christ himself. We have the wrong priorities, and the reason we do is because we have no vision past this world. We're not really walking in light of the next world. Now, I have a problem with that myself. I'm sure you get caught up with these responsibilities and these demands and so you just sort of come under all of it and really the whole key to walking out our life in Christ is looking beyond this world in light of the heavenly that's the only way you can walk it out now we're often earth bound and not heaven ready we're earthbound and not heaven ready. 
We relish in the temporary excitement of the world while yawning, you might say, at the prospect of worshiping God in heaven forever. We yawn at it. Oh, is that all there is? Really? If that's what you think, then you don't know God. You don't love God. The question is, will you be prepared to meet God? There's nothing to yawn about when it comes to heaven. We want to experience the world's best, but we will not partake of heaven's glory by faith. We won't pursue it. We won't look for it. We won't walk in it through obedience to the word of God. That's just our value system. We have been indoctrinated by the world's value system. The church has adjusted the value system of the world into its own a reality. And so we have this terrible mixture and we don't even realize it. And we think we're okay because we're judging ourselves according to the mixture and not according to the word of God and the reality of Christ. People talk about the church today, and I tell, I, I want to challenge them and say, I want you to go to Acts, the first church, and really study who they were and what they did, and tell me if your church matches. If it doesn't, don't talk to me about how great your church is. Because the church in Acts turned the world upside down. Uh, the world was never the same after the church in Acts. The world is turning us upside down. And we are so accustomed to it. We let it flip us. And we don't even know because mm -hmm. we're not really testing ourselves according to what the Word of God says. We're buying the little bits of information that the church gives us about this and that, which is really taken out of context. It's not put in context. And so we think we're okay. People go to Acts and find out if we're okay as a church. Peter is, I mean, Paul is really trying to get us to understand what we have in Christ. We want religious fruits that give the impression that we are religious enough Decent enough, pious enough, however you want to look at, we give the impression, but the question is, who are we acceptable to, really, in the end? Are we acceptable to God? The question would probably be no, if we're being honest, because we have this little compromise here, we have this little worldly attitude here, we have this little here, we have all these little things, these bits and pieces that we have instituted into our Christian uh, religion instead of allowing the, the Spirit to adjust us, line us up, and bring us into that excellent place with Christ. The challenges are real. We do not want to... We do not want to partake of the divine if it requires us to consecrate all to the Lord. We don't want to partake of the divine. We don't want to be responsible for having that touch of reality of de deity in our lives that should change us, that should bring godliness out in us, that should br bring the best out. We don't really want to become so diverse and different from the world that they call us radical. They call us uh, fanatics. We don't want to be called that. You know, we've had people call us fanatics. And I say, are you kidding? We're not even close to it, okay? Don't even go there. I read Acts, we're not close. How could you call me fanatic? Well, that's how far away from the light they are. They're cold. They were, they were hot maybe one time, but they became very lukewarm. And eventually you just become cold. And so we have all these ideas about different things, but how does, 
how will God look at it? So many times we accept man's religion, man's idea. We don't ever check ourselves out with God's perspective. The problem is that we want all this stuff with God that requires us to walk in the light, to abide in his presence, and to hold on to that which is eternal, but we don't want to pay the price for it. We don't want to partake of the divine. We don't want to consecrate ourselves. We don't want to get really serious because then people are going to mock us and the church is going to call us fanatic because we're not going to think in light of what they're telling us. We're going to be independent thinkers. Do you know how dangerous that is? It's very dangerous. Because the church wants you to comply, not think, not discern, not call yourself to a personal accountability of the word and call them to the personal accountability of the word. They don't want you to know that maybe they don't have the goods. As long as you comply and go along with them, they're not threatened. But as soon as you start finding your life in Christ and you're saying, wait a minute, that's not what the word says, you become a threat to them. And guess what they're probably going to do? They're probably going to sacrifice you. They're probably going to have you for dinner because you're a threat to their religious kingdom. You see, the kingdoms we see in the church today are no different and then the religious school systems of Pharisees and the Sadducees of, day, of Jesus' day. They're no different in how they react, how they think, because it's all part of the system. People, let me tell you right now, the system is Antichrist. They don't care who you worship as long as you don't know who you worship. They don't care uh, how you play the game as long as you don't get genuine about living the life you're called to. You're a danger if you do that. You're going to be a mirror that they don't like. Now, that's a tragedy of where man's religion goes when he leaves God behind. And most of man's religion will leave God behind. It will tack on things of the Bible. It will do this and that but it will leave the true reality of Christ behind. We have to start thinking about such things. We have to hold on to that which is eternal. Consider what 2 Peter 3, uh, excuse me, 1, 3, and 4 says. We're going to look at that. Because you see, we have to partake of the divine if we are going to be people who walk in line of godliness. So let's look at what it says in 3 and 4. It says, according to his divine power, has he given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, according to as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Oh, I read that, sorry. Whereby are given unto us, this is verse 4, uh, given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. Notice those two words. That by these you might be what? Partakers of the divine nature. And notice the next st statement that follows. At having escaped. You've done this. You've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now when you partake of the divine, the, the lust of the world is, is, is going to be very unattractive to you. You're going to be repulsed by it. Because you're going to have that contrast in your life. You see, we want to run parallel to Christianity, most of us. We want to be close enough, looking like we're going the same direction as we can. But we do not want to line up 
We do not want to line up to the life of godliness that we have to walk out daily through obedience by faith. We want to be as close to religion as we can be to receive, but not so close that we actually become identified with Christ. We, we need to be identified to Jesus, to his life. But the problem is that if you are, you could be shunned, you could be mocked, you could be criticized by the world. And that's hard when we're trying to keep peace with it. We want the best of both worlds, don't we? And we, and we want to end up in, with everything we can. But you know what happens when we try to combine the world with Christianity? Please hear me. We end up with crumbs of the world and rejection from God. Can't be that way. There's no agreement there. There is completely a distinction between the unholy and the profane. We're the ones that fudge the line because it serves our purpose. But God hasn't changed, and he won't fudge that line. And we have to get a hold of that. We want the acceptance of the world, but fail to be concerned as to whether we're doing what the Lord approves of so he can accept us and recognize us. You know who we accept the recognition and acceptance from? Other Christians. That's who we look for to be accepted from. Oh, well, they accept me. Certainly God will accept me, right? They recognize me as one of theirs. Certainly God will recognize me as one of his. Really? You are assuming and presuming things. It could get you in trouble in the end. You better know whose side you're on. And you better know if you're just being accepted by status quo of religion or whether God is really embracing you because you are lining up to him. I want to challenge you today. Don't accept man's approval. Don't assume because you're in the current of the church that you're okay or presume that you got to be right because of all these other people around you agreeing with you. If God doesn't agree with you, you're out of luck. We have that responsibility to make sure we're lining up. It's not the responsibility of the church. It's not even the responsibility of the people around you. It's yours. You have to own it. You have to own your Christian life. You have to own what you do. You have to own what you believe. So what do you agree with? We want to get along with everyone while failing to come into agreement with God. Look, people, you can agree with the devil. But what's going to make sure that you're okay with God is that you're in agreement with him. And if you're in agreement with him, you're not going to be in agreement with the devil. You're not going to be able to placate the world, play footsies, with things that maybe are not honorable enough. The reality of God is going to put a check in you and say, ah, that is unacceptable. I can't go there. I can't do that. I won't. Because what's wrong to God has to be wrong to me, too. There's, there's no in-betweens. Uh, some of you uh, may have written my uh, little... Uh, post on Jeremiah 12.5. Some of you know that scripture, but it says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how can thou contend with horses? Think about what he's saying. It's a principle here. And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? I want you to think about what he's saying here. He's saying, hey, you know what? You think you're okay here. You're running with the footman, okay? But you're weary with it. 
You're weary with the battle. You're weary with all the things that go on with running with the footmen, and yet you want more. But if you can't run with them, how can you contend with the horses? He's saying if you are weary living in a land of peace, Think about what he's saying. If you're weary with living in the land of peace, because it's not as exciting, it's not as wonderful, it doesn't feed your flesh, it doesn't feed your dreams, it doesn't do anything for you. You're weary with that peace. You're weary with that abundance that you have. You're weary. Basically, you're unthankful, but you're weary with it. If you're weary in the land of peace, What's going to happen when the Jordan swells and begins to flood? Are you able to stand? You see, the problem I have today with the church I see, and even in my own life, I wonder if we can stand. I wonder if we can stand when the real war comes with the horses and the chariots. I wonder if we can stand when the, the river does start swelling of judgment against this land. Because we have taken so much for granted. We're unthankful, we're ungrateful, we're selfish, we're angry because we can't get our way most of the time. And what is our way? To live like the devil and not pay the consequences. I love what Jeremiah said in, his, in that because it's so true for us today. When you look at what happened to Judah, they were a land of peace and abundance and God sent in the armies because why they were wicked they were partying you know what the biggest problem today with Americans we want to party 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 when I live for the next party I hear it all the time I see the parting spirit on TV. It's sickening and disgusting. There is no moral compass in any of it. Well, guess what? That's where Judah was. They said they were parting and betting on the, on the armies of Babylon when they were going to take over. That is how flippant they were. They were so far divorced from reality. We're not much different today. I want you to know, I have become weary with trying to live in this world while maintaining my vision and focus on the next. I've become weary with it. I've heard the excuses. I've seen people run back to their vomit and their pig pans after contending with them. I've heard the excuses why they don't obey God. I've heard it all. I get weary with it. You know why I get worried with it? It takes the air out of me when I see people want to lose. It takes the air out of me when I invest in somebody, the life of Christ, and then I walk away. That's what makes you weary. You know what used to make me weary? This is what used to make me weary is when I tried to bring agreement between the world and my Christianity. That is what caused me the greatest weariness in my life. It robbed me, it stole from me, and I got weary with life. Now my weariness is a little different because it has to do with my life in Christ and what he's done for humanity how he's died for them, how he offers the best, he offers abundance, and they, even Christians. Now, we're trying to make agreement between the world and our heavenly calling instead of do, do, what, instead of do what the Bible says, which is come out and be separate, saith the Lord and I will be your God, and you will be my children. Don't touch the unclean thing. If you want to look that up, it's in 2 Corinthians 6, by the way. 
Now, we are clearly told what our attitude should be towards the works of darkness. We're told how we should look at any work of darkness and what our responsibility is when it, we encounter those works of darkness. You have to realize the world lies in darkness and the flesh walks in it. Now people, when we talk about darkness, you have to discern if someone calls themselves a Christian or not. If they're a Christian, you hold them to the word of God. If they don't like it, then say, don't call yourself a Christian. Admit you're bent on hell and you're not saved. Because only at that you might get saved. I hold them to the word of God if they call themselves Christians. But if they're not, they already know they're in sin. They already know they're in darkness. You know what they need to see is your light. And they can't see it if you're being compromising with the world. They can't see it if you're trying to calm down the truth a little bit here and there. When you're not being willing to be compassionate, it's easy to be judgmental. Are you willing to be compassionate and enter in? There's different ways in which we handle darkness. It comes down to what people claim about darkness. But Paul is very clear how we are to deal with darkness. Let's look at verse 11. It says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. This is what he's saying. That's not what I'm saying. In all the years that I've been a Christian, may I say something? The only reason I know about the scripture is I read it and took it to heart. I haven't heard preached on I do not hear pastors saying, you've got to reprove darkness, whether it's in your life, in your homes, or in this church, you must reprove it. I don't hear that. That's not one, that wouldn't be a popular message. But yet, isn't that what Paul is saying here? First of all, you can't be in fellowship with any fruit unfruitful works. And how many people in church are really living in sin and we're playing footsies with them. We're basically helping them to hell. They don't see anything wrong with what they're doing. They're being associates to religion. Why would God reject them? We have to come back and to this reality of what he's saying. Now some of the Attitude of Christians, if we must be careful not to insult anyone. Have you heard that? Oh, we mustn't insult them. Really? Let me go and tell you something about truth. It's going to insult you. If you just tell the truth the way the Bible says it, you're going to insult people. Because you know what? Truth cuts away their baloney. And brings them face to face with what is so. And they don't like it. But you know what? That's not your problem. That's theirs. We have to start being realistic about what's going on around us. Because we can sit there, okay, and try to not insult anyone. I'm here to tell you the main reason we don't want to assault anybody is because we're a bunch of cowards. We don't want the repercussions. We don't want the fallout. We don't want to be the bad person. We don't want to be the unloving person. And you're going to be accused of all those things. Get over yourself. A soul is on the line. It doesn't matter who you are. They have to hear the truth. And maybe the truth is God loves you. Maybe that's all they need to hear. Maybe you can say, you know what? You can escape your miserable life through Christ. He can forgive you. He can set you free. We don't know what that is. But I'm going to tell you something. The truth is going to insult people, so get over it. 
We've insulted a lot of people. Had people walk away. They said they were our friends. But they were insulted by the truth. But there had to be something wrong with me for telling them the truth. You know what? It's their problem. I said, if I'm scripturally off, you come to me, show me scripturally that I'm off. But I want you to know, if you don't have the scriptural proof, I'm going to have you for dinner. Because I will show you scripturally. People, I can't imagine this, are a little intimidated by me. But you see, I know where I, what I believe. I know what I stand for. I know it because it is in the word of God. And I will not move from that because that's the only safe place I have. That is where the absolutes of things are. I don't lay down and play, oh, they reject me. I don't care. If, if it's the truth, they're rejecting the truth, not me. Not me. And I'm not going to be offended over that. And I'm not going to, oh, forgive me. No, I'm not sorry for sharing the truth with you. We need to quit apologizing. We need to quit cowering. And we need to just stand in meekness and truth and say, this is the way it is. Hey, I love you. I don't want you to go to hell. So I'm telling you the truth today. We have to be willing to hurt fragile egos. In other words, people, reprove means some major things. And I'm going to tell you what it means. Reprove means to admonish, which is to caution someone that they're in trouble. How many people are heading to hell in trouble? Here's another one, reprimand. Oh, reprimand? Yeah, you're wrong. You are just wrong. How about convict? You, there has to be a conviction of offense or guilt. If they are, they are. They stand guilty. How about convince? Reprove means to convince, persuade, or prove something is wrong. We have the word of God. That pretty well shows who's wrong and right. Stand on it. Here's another one. Rebuke. Actually, one is tell a fault. You are in error to make them responsible for it. But the last one is rebuke. What is rebuke? Well, rebuke is censure the deed, reveal the reproach it brings. I heard one time, I don't know if this is true, but I thought it was always interesting. By the way, I just want to ask you a question before I get to this. Where does it say, handle sin with kid gloves? Handle darkness with kid gloves. I don't see that. Because you're wrestling and contending for someone's soul. There's nothing more serious to God than that. But one time I was listening to this person about rebuke. I thought it was very interesting. He says, reprove is to awaken them that can be awakened. Rebuke are for those who are fools who refuse to hear. My question today is when you're dealing with somebody, can you reprove them or rebuke them? If you're standing before somebody today and you're in the wrong, will what they say to you be reproof or rebuke? Think about what I said. It's the spirit behind it. Your spirit as to whether you can be reproved or rebuked. Paul is trying to bring this down to the reality that you cannot play with darkness. You can't play with it. Now you may tell people the truth and they may not want to hear it, but you still told them the truth. Okay? They may run and hide from you because they don't want to know the truth. 
They don't want to see the problem. Jeanette and I were, we were dealing with this young lady that was in the wrong. I'm going to tell you what she was doing. She's committing fornication. And she had been a very intricate part of the ministry. We were working with her, discipling her, and all of a sudden she came up missing. We didn't hear from her. And Jeanette says, I bet you she's in sin. I said, you're probably right. She's hiding from us. You know, people jump up and down if people are hiding from you. Because you're not going to let them get away with anything. And sure enough, she finally had enough of her sin. She finally came back and she says, well, I've been in this sin. And, and Jeanette says, we already know. What are you going to do? Are you going to repent? And she did. But you need to know, if you stand for light and truth, those people that you might have to rebuke, they're going to hide from you anyway. But it's better to have the reputation and then have them say, oh, I can, I can do this around them because they're not going to say anything to me. Because after all, God loves me. They don't want to insult me. I'll tell you, when she finally came back to God, she had already been rebuked. You have to think about that. She'd been rebuked by our unwillingness to ever go along with her. That's the greatest rebuke to them. Now, we have to get down to the fact that when we rebuke someone, we are scolding them in their mind. We're scolding them. It's like taking a rebellious little child and scolding them and saying, you're wrong and you're going to get spanked, whatever, but we're scolding them. Now, if I reprove somebody, I'm not scolding them. They're saying, wow, I better think about that. I better pray about that. Yeah, it makes me mad, but I'm going to pray about it anyway. And I'm going to find out if that's true. If it's true, I need to repent. We need to know the difference. Here, who is Paul talking to? He's talking to Christians that should, in all means, be able to be reproved for what they're doing. That's why the term rebuke is not here. Look at what he says in verse 12. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. It's a shame, people, to speak of such things that are being done in darkness. To speak of it as casual, flippant. Things that God calls sacred, we don't anymore. We've made it into a joke. Because we have not maintained the sacredness of how God looks at something. Case in point, marriage. Another case in point, children. We can go down the line. What God has called sacred, man says, mm, to you, God. I'm going to do what I want to do. I want, I'll be the most immoral, the most improper, the most dishonorable person in those areas. Tough. Let's see what you do about it. What's the church's attitude towards it? That's the question. You have to get down that you're not to dance with it, to get along with it, or, or somehow ignore the boasting of it. It's like people have no problem with sin anymore in the church, in their lives, living together. That's a big one in the church. There's lots of people living together. In the, I don't care. Oh, it's okay. I'm doing this because I'm going to lose my spouse's, uh, you know, uh, social security and whatever. And money is so much more important than my moral testimony before God. I wonder how much, how important that money is going to be to God when they stand before him. I read this on Facebook. I had to put it down. 
It says, listen to what it says. It says, first, we overlook evil. Then we permit evil. Then we legalize evil. Then we promote evil. Then we celebrate evil. Then we persecute those who still call it evil. We are there today. And sadly, some of it's coming from the church. The organized church, I should say. Now, we often try to con ourselves, people, I know. We have tried to con the world with our so-called love, compassion, understanding, instead of speak the truth and love because we love them and we care about their souls. Think about what I'm saying. We have flipped the whole idea of love around. We have bought the idea of the world's love instead of walked in the love of God. The ones we have conned the most is ourselves with this modern day American Christianity, which is ineffective. We don't want to be too uncomfortable, too controversial, too radical, and yet when you speak the truth, you're going to cut through the nonsense. Expect it. What I spoke about, this evil, is the digression of sin when good men remain silent. When good men remain silent about it. I'm not talking about religious men, righteous men, I'm sorry, or godly men. I'm not talking about the righteous men or the godly men. It says when good men, when decent men, fell to speak against evil. I'll tell you about the righteous, they're firebrands. They can't keep quiet. I'll tell you about the godly, they're mirrors. They will insult people just by their life, okay? That's, I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about those good old boys, the decent, where they're trying to get along with everybody, right? The Bible warns that that is foolishness. We console ourselves that we're not so bad after all, but we slowly are being rendered ineffective because the darkness is consuming our homes, our churches, our nation. It's consuming it because we are trying to get along with it. We're like the, I should say, the visible church is like the famous frog in the boiling pot. You heard that one before, I'm sure. I think every preacher jumped on that in the 1990s or whenever it was popular. Let's, let's, let's look at 13 here. It says, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. What's it saying? People, when you turn on the light, people can't ignore what they see. They can't. Once it's in the light, it's in the light. You can't take away the ugliness of it. You can't do away with what you see. It's in the light. I, can tell, I can't tell you how much light silences darkness. When darkness is removed, people are like a deer caught in the, in the headlights. They don't know what to do. They're actually foes in the headlights. In fact, what you have is when people uh, operate in uh, darkness and you put the light on, they're like a bunch of cockroaches. I was one time uh, visiting, we were visiting my, parent, uh, my father's parents in Oklahoma. They lived in this pretty old house. And uh, we had two, two different uh, suggestions. One is get to sleep before grandma sleeps because she'll snore and keep you awake. The second one that we were told is when you turn on those lights, 
just know you're going to have a lot of living creatures running for the darkness. And you could hear them. They're called cockroaches. I want you to know that light will not produce crusaders. True light will not produce these crusaders that run around to straighten people up. Rather, light reveals the matter, so in love we can stand on truth of a matter and wisely confront it. You see, poor Carrie had to confront some things. And what she found out is once she put the light on the darkness, people were scrambling. They were backtracking. And it silenced them. That's the power of light. Now, you have to consider what Paul says here in 14. He says, wherefore, he says, awake, awake, that that's thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Wow. You know what happens in darkness? People get sleepy. And then they go to sleep. That's the purpose of darkness. The purpose of the darkness in this world is to put you to sleep. That's why you have to walk in the light so you don't go to sleep. Paul was saying even in that day, there were some that were asleep because of the darkness. He says, wake up. Wake up. Wake up from the dead and the, and the useless and the lifeless. Wake up from it. And Christ will once again give you light to walk in and you won't go to sleep again. Sometimes you wonder how many people are asleep in the church because they started out in the gray area compromise and then they slowly got more and more into the dark shadows and finally... They went to sleep. The light will waken you. It will help you to know what is so and what needs to be your next step. Remember something. The world is conditioning you to be quiet about darkness right now. It's conditioning you to be quiet about darkness. And it's doing so. We have become soft on sin and hard against the absolutes of truth. That's what we have. Soft on sin and hard against the absolute truth of God. We have to arise from the indifference or complacency when it comes to any sin because it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your testimony. But when you're paying that price, remember, your sin cost God his son. And it cost Jesus his all. So tell me, what is so great about your cost? When you stand in the light on truth. We have to begin to look at all of this. Why did Jesus... Come in the first place as a light. You know why he came in the first place? Into the darkness? So we could be saved. And that hasn't changed. That mission has not changed even today. The light is necessary so people can flee the wrath of God and be saved. That's the importance of the light. The, the light. As long as people remain in darkness, people, I don't care who they are, even people going to church, as long as they remain in darkness, they are lost to God. That light has to come on. It has to come on. It has to show people where they're at. If these people can get you to partake of their darkness, they will not feel threatened or challenged. 
But meanwhile, your testimony receives a black eye. They don't have to take you too serious. You lose your edge, and now there's no light of conviction. Once you lose that edge of that light in your life, that testimony, then there's no means of conviction because only the light convicts. Only the light shows. Only the light reveals. You have to remember that. What happens is that a type of gray comes in as a person begins to slide into um, darkness. And that's what happens. And maybe you can slide into that little comfort zone of grays and shades and what have you. But guess what? In doing so, you lose your edge, your authority. You lose your edge. There's no distinction in your life. And the result is that there is also no repentance. We're not seeing it. And no salvation. We're not seeing it. Why are we here to play church? We're here so people can be saved. That's why we're here. There are no shortcuts. If we're, people aren't being saved, close the doors. Get on your face. Get a vision, whatever. But you step up as the church and you start doing what God has called you to do. We have to challenge even the people around us. You know what? There's Christians in depression because they don't know what to do. They're not taught. They're not challenged. There's no urgency. There's nothing. Because it's not coming from the pulpits. It's not coming from other Christians. There's no urgency. There's nothing. We wonder why we don't see anybody saved. And if they do say the sinner's prayer, we don't see them again. If there's no repentance, people, there's no salvation. And there's no reconciliation between man and God. And you know what? It leaves man just as lost and miserable as ever. And sometimes worse. I want you to know something. This is tough. The world's only hope is you and me. Not the organized church, you and me. That's the world's only hope. That's the loss. Only hope is you and me. We have the commission. We have the voice. We have the responsibility. We have the tools. Are we using them? So my question is, what do you think of Ephesians 5 now? Would you like that part out of the Bible because it sort of gets a little rough? The truth is many walk parallel to the Christian life. Many walk parallel to the Christian life, but fail to walk in the light. There's a big difference. Walking parallel to the Christian life is not walking in the light of that life. Religions that walk parallel to God, God's word, but is not lining up to it, is referred to as cults. That's what they are, cults. They're walking parallel, but they're not lining up. They're walking over here in shades of gray. They're not walking in the light. Do you still have the warm fuzzies because of what awaits us in glory, or are you beginning to be stirred up? Are you being awakened? Are you being convicted because of your attitude and handling of darkness in the past? Are you now beginning to sense an urgency? An urgency to what? To be about the real business of the Father in a dark, dying world. That should be our urgency.